thank you so much, Paul, Angela, and Allison. What a great start to our morning on this St. Patrick's Day weekend, and it's also very close to the Persian New Year, or Navraz, or Navruz, depending on whether you're from India or um, uh, Persia, as, as um, I was learning. And um, so anyway, it's fun to have cultural music bringing us together. Hello, my name is Susan Forbes, and I'll be your service associate this morning, and it's an honor to be with you today. We're in for a real treat today as we have our guest speaker, Dr. Hussein Jean Mohammed. I'll introduce Hussein shortly, but first I'd like to welcome all of you to the North Shore Unitarian Church, where our mission is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. In this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life, no matter what you do or what you question. No matter who you are or who you love, we hope you will feel welcome here, where we believe that embracing diversity makes us stronger, wiser, and more whole. And now, as an indication that our time here is holy, please join me as we light our chalice. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness, and may the warmth of sharing bring us peace. I'll now invite you into a ritual of centering. So should, should you care to participate, please come up to silently light a candle of joy or aspiration and place it in our bed of communion soil, knowing that your joy brings joy to others in this community. And alternately, if you have a burden or grief that you wish to release, please drop a stone into our communion water and take comfort in knowing that your burden is held by this congregation. And today I've asked Chris Miller, or the, although there were others that I could ask today, but I've asked her to light the first candle of joy to honor the fact that this very day is NSUC's 56th anniversary. And um, Chris's mom and dad, um, Eleanor and Peter Jones, were founding members of this church, and we're very lucky to have other founding members. B. Edgar is here, and David Clark is here, I'm told. And um, is Karen Funt here? As she was a youth uh, sig signatory, and so we're just um, very happy to all have you recognize that we're building on their efforts, and we've been um, a spiritual and ethical community since March 19, 1967. So we've been through some very positive times over those years and some more challenging times, but today we celebrate that we're still here aspiring to make the world a better place. So I've asked Bruce Grierson to drop the first stone as we hold Sonia Macro in our hearts. She's had a fall at home and she's landed right on her tailbone, but luckily she didn't break anything. But true to her spirit, she would love people to call or maybe even join her for a cup of tea just so she can take her mind off her hurts. So now please come up uh, behind Chris and Bruce if you wish to help celebrate your joys or drop a stone to release a concern and fortify your heart. By doing so, you help us knit together as a community. Uh, the, down there, Bruce. The choir will be singing along with the multi-faith chant written by our Catherine Nicholson. Um, I'm just going to share with you and sing you the first phrase so that if you should choose to sing along or hum along, you feel confident in that. It goes like this, and the words are Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. In the name of taking away fear, it goes like this. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Oh, my God. 
So our topic this morning is Building Cultural Bridges Through Music. And Hussein, of course, is our guest speaker. But before I introduce him, I'll quickly share my own story about building cultural bridges. I grew up in Winnipeg in a neighborhood with a fairly large Jewish population. And most of my direct neighbors were Jewish, and a lot of my very close friends and schoolmates were Jewish. In my grade nine class, for example, almost a third of the kids were Jewish. In case you're wondering, that's me on the front end at the left. And can you recognize the person fifth from the right hand back row, fifth from the right, from the right side? He's in the room. <laughs> yeah, Brian and I, it turns out we're in the same grade nine class. And Anyway, I spent a lot of my time in my Jewish friends' homes, and I often even went to synagogue. So through these experiences, I learned early on that there were different ways to think about the sacred and that people had different customs and holidays. And there was another culture, if you will, right, right in my own backyard. And of course, then later in life, I, had, I was able to travel and be immersed in many different cultures, but my first career job gave me an even better intercultural perspective, because in a way, the world came to me. My first job was in the grain industry. I'd studied agriculture at university, and Winnipeg was the center of Canada's industry, so it was a natural fit. I joined an organization called the Canadian International Grains Institute, or SIGI for short. And SIGI was a soft cell marketing arm of the Canadian Wheat Board, which at that time sold most of our wheat and barley. Now, SIGI's modus operandi was to bring groups of Canadian grain customers to Winnipeg for five weeks at a time. And they'd live together in a long-term hotel, and they'd take part in uh, their educational programs that taught them why grain from Canada was the best in the world. <laughs> and interestingly, those programs would involve not only grain customers, but Canadian grain industry executives as well. The idea was to bring people maybe from 15 different countries together. And the secret sauce was that while they learned together, they would also make personal connections and build relationships. So not only were they together in classrooms and labs and grain grading centers and social receptions, but they also traveled together. And part of my job, lucky me, was to take these groups of men and if you'll notice, they were all men in those days, no diversity back then in the industry, and take them on tours across Western Canada to visit uh, farms and primary elevators and the like, and with a nice stop at Lake Louise, and then on to Vancouver to tour the big bulk terminals. And the idea was that a grain buyer from Saudi Arabia or Lebanon or Japan or wherever who was thinking about buying a shipload of grain, that they would remember that Canadian grain was the best, but even more important, they'd remember the relationships that they had fostered with their cohorts. And they'd be able to pick up the phone and order a shipload of wheat or whatever. It was a very successful approach to grain marketing. And you know what? I, um, I don't remember so much about the grain industry anymore, but what has stayed with me is how much trust was built among people from all over the world as they got to really know each other during the five intense weeks that they'd spend together. And just one example, um, during one program, we had a participant from Lebanon and another from Israel. And their two countries in the early 70s were on the verge of war at that time, and, and yet those two men became fast friends. And it's because in Canada, they learned that their values were more alike than they were different, and they, they really discovered common ground. And during their five weeks with Siggy, they built, they built a bridge across a cultural divide. And then the sad part was that when they went home, they couldn't even write letters to each other except through an intermediary. But fortunately, in Canada, with our diverse society, we are able to build permanent cultural bridges across divides, and by getting to know each other through whatever means possible, and I think as Hussein will attest, making music is perhaps one of the best ways. So, I invite you now into the spiritual practice of generosity in memory of Danny Macon Cooper, who was a young adult from this community who we sadly lost recently. And in her honor, 
Our entire plate collection today will be divided among the above three charities, the Coast Mental Health, Family Smart, and Canadian Mental Health Association. And they all provide mental health support to families and youth. Please give as generously as you are able. Will the ushers please come forward? The song the choir is going to sing now is Never One Thing. And it's not so much about diversity on a global scale as much as it is of embracing the diversity within us. It's about embracing the fact that we are wonderful and we are terrible. We are loving and we hate. That we are perfect and we are fallen. So uh, please enjoy Never One Thing. Oh. 
So, Jill or Rebecca, I'm trusting that you're going to move this along because I can't see what you're doing up there. But <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I chose, actually, Marsha helped me choose this story. She's not able to be here this morning. Here. Oh, there she is. Uh, and, and this storybook was donated um, by Mary Simons. Mm. So it felt like a very important message here. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A boy and his grandfather stood on a city sidewalk looking up at the words printed on a billboard. Grandpa, what does that say? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. People all over the world call those words the golden rule. What does it mean, the boy wanted to know, and why is it golden? It means this, treat people the way you would like to be treated. It's golden because it's so valuable and a way of living your life that's so simple, it shines. Grandfather led the boy to another billboard further down the sidewalk. Some people put the golden rule another way. Do nothing to other people that you would not like having done to you. Either way, he said, it's a very good rule. Well, who's it, who's it for, the boy asked. You, me, anyone can practice the golden rule. A rule that's the same for children and grown-ups, same rule. There aren't too many rules like that, very few. And it's for people everywhere, everywhere. Whatever their religion, people find the idea of the golden rule in their holy books, grandfather said. Christianity says you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. Judaism says what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow humans. Islam says hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. And Hinduism says this is the sum of duty. Do nothing to others which would cause them pain. Buddhism says, do not do to others what would hurt you. And the Shawnee tribe says, do not kill or injure your neighbor for it is not he or she that you injure. You injure yourself. The boy and his grandfather sat on a park bench. So, Grandpa, how can I start to practice the golden rule? You begin by using your imagination. My imagination? You imagine how someone else feels. For instance, a new child who is joining your class. How do you think that boy or girl is feeling? Well, new kids always look scared. Would you be scared if it was you? Oh, yes. What would make you feel better? If, if someone smiled at me. So to practice the golden rule, you would smile at the new kid? You got it. <laughs> I bet you can think of other ways you'd like to be treated and ways you wouldn't want to be treated how do you feel when you're teased or bullied, sad, yes, mad, yes, small, I feel small, sad, mad, small. Do you like feeling like that? No, neither does anyone else. The boy thought for a moment about the golden rule. I see. There are lots of things I can do. I should tell the truth because I don't like being lied to. I want people to listen to me so I should listen to other people. And when I'm sick or when I'm tired, sometimes I need help, so I should offer my help to those who need it. You're getting the idea, Grandfather nodded. The boy looked at his grandfather. Practicing the golden rule seems like it can be hard. I said it was simple. I didn't say it would always be easy. Grandpa, the boy said, 
the golden rule is a very big thing, isn't it? Very big and very small and very old. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Thousands of years? Well then, I don't think everyone is practicing it the way they should. <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many problems between people, between countries. You're right, my boy. I wonder how things would change if everyone lived by the golden rule. I think people would be nicer, kinder, they'd act better toward their families and friends and even strangers. What if countries lived by the golden rule? Grandfather asked. Well, then people wouldn't want to hurt each other because they don't like being hurt. And maybe there wouldn't be wars. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Wonderful, Grandpa. But you can't make everyone in the world practice the golden rule. There's only one person you can ask to do that. Me? You. It begins with you. Yes. Thank you for behaving so well. <laughs> musician, composer, conductor, and educator. And in addition to many other academic accomplishments, he just recently obtained his PhD in music from the University of Toronto. Hussein's passion is to use pluralistic musical collaborations to create powerful pathways for spiritual connection and cultural understanding and much of his work is with underserved communities. His multifaceted experiences in those realms have, had, have helped him transform the negativity of racism and other life challenges into positive feelings of belonging and contribution, both for himself and others. Hussein also works with diverse groups of professional and amateur singers, including the National Youth Choir of Canada, Corleone Men's Choir, and the Toronto-based El Esmer, Elmer Esler Singers. Yeah. Eisler, sorry. He's the founding director of the Vancouver and Canadian Ismaili Muslim Youth Choirs, and he's had the pleasure of singing at Carnegie Hall and performing in the presence of many dignitaries, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Governor General Adrian Clarkson, must have been younger when he did that, <laughs> <laughs> and His Highness the Aga Khan. You'll learn much more about Hussein as he shares his reflections with us today. And we're honored to have him with us. And after the second part of his discussion, he's even going to teach you a song. So be prepared. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh. Nein, oh, say, nein, mi lavo mere sahib, nein, oh, say, nein, oh, say, nein, mi lavo mere Sahib, ab teri mohabbat laa. 
lagi In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, our divine, divine beloved, let us take a moment of gratitude for this gift of sharing together this morning. I'm honored to be here with you. I've been uh, familiar with the Unitarian Church for many years. Um, I don't know if some of you may know Harold Brown, uh, a very renowned pianist who I had a chance to meet at UBC. Um, and also I've known Allison and Catherine for many years, and I want to say thank you to both of you for, and Sue, I've just met, I uh, want to say thank you for inviting me to be here and, and for your welcome and hospitality um, in, in this sharing. I would, what I'm sharing to you is, with you today is a bit of a slice of my life experience, and um, it's a personal reflection more than a sermon, but uh, there will be some aspect of some teaching and, and also storytelling. And I think what I'm sharing to you after hearing the first part of today's service is, is how I came to think in an integrative cultural bridges perspective. Um, and music has been a very par much part of that, as well as being uh, belonging to the Ismaili tradition and being Canadian. Um, the poetry I just recited is a 500-year-old South Asian Ismaili Muslim devotional poem, and the text articulates the longing of the lover who, became, who becomes fully in love, even for a, with God, the beloved. And in the text, may my eyes meet your eyes, um, the lover says to, to the beloved God, and because my heart is in love with you, I seek this. And the second verse, which I didn't sing, says, open the curtain and grant me the gift of your smiling face. I ask, how can we see one another eye to eye? What does it mean to lift the veil of our barriers and, and boundaries of identity and ego to see each other eye to eye? The eyes are the window to the soul. When we look into the eye of the other, how can we come to know the soul, reflections in the other of ourselves and of God? How can this remembrance, a kind of return home of sorts, inform the work of our head, heart, and hand, and help us to come together harmoniously? As Kabir the poet suggests, it is through love. Adding the words of another Ismaili traditional text, it's not the love that is sold in stores or grown in trees, but it's the love that is cultivated in the heart. I belong to the Shia Ismaili interpretation of Islam, which uh, some of you may know already. It's a transnational branch of Islam. The followers are bound by a pledge of allegiance to our living spiritual leader, His Highness the Aga Khan. The Ismaili community represents a global diversity of people and cultures. And I draw on experience of the Kojak community a subgroup of Ismailis who trace their roots to western regions of the Indian subcontinent and migration through East Africa. So I think of being Ismaili as a way of life, informed by a, what I call an esoteric worldview. In this worldview, spirituality and life are infused with each other. All of life is sacred. The search for oneness with God, love, and active participation in society are all inextricably linked. And the Quran reminds us that we come from one soul, and we are interconnected. Rooted in this knowledge, we are charged to know one another and carry out a sacred responsibility to care for each other. Knowledge is sought for two purposes, to know God and God's creation, and to use that knowledge to improve the conditions of the world. This is a humanistic view that I believe is shared amongst all of us um, that shapes our Canadian identity, and it shapes my identity as, as an Ismaili living here in this world. As part of this worldview, the arts, culture, and creativity are integral in knowing, feeling, and expressing this worldview. Music and sound are part and parcel of this dynamic spiritual and social quest. His Highness the Aga Khan emphasizes that music is essential in human spirituality. 
And within the diverse interpretations of Islam, the conception of music changes, but the use of music and sound is universal. And then within that, devotional music, like the, the poem I just recited, influences an everyday ethical soundscape. Uh, Charles Hirschkin, an ethnomusicologist, talks about this ethical soundscape as part of an acoustic architecture that animates and sustains our ethical sensibilities. So the world in which we live, the sounds of the world become like um, uh, devotional acoustic architectures for us to be human and to remember our humanity. And to me, this comes back to love. And so if we take Hirschkin's idea, then the acoustic architecture in which we live is love. And how do we create that? How do we create it so that our heart, mind, our social life all becomes just expressions of love? Music and sound for me have been a way to know that love. So um, before I conclude this section, I thought it would be lovely to experience, um, or as I conclude this section, I thought it would be lovely to experience the power of devotional music and singing, um, even at the simplest level, to hopefully awaken our own memories and embodied feelings of remembrance in who we are and who we could be. And so um, the choir is going to sing uh, a composition that arrived to me one uh, fairly recently. And, uh, and then after that, I will talk more about sort of how my life experience um, helped me create music like this um, and bring the worlds together. So this piece is, um, well, I don't actually have a title to the piece, but uh, it's based on a Ismaili devotional hymn called Sahib Ji Tu More Mana um, So my, my beloved, my Lord, my man, which is heart and mind. It's not just mind or not. It's, it's a word that encompasses all of our being has become in love with you. And and then it says, There's none else in the world other than you that I know and I love and that I seek. There's, and then the poem emphasizes, there's no, no other person or there's no other entity except for you. That I, that I seek and love. There's a beautiful, the rest of the poem is very beautiful. Um, and one, that I, one verse that I love talks about how everything I ask, you indulge in infinite ways. And I really believe that our soul always asks and has intentions that are always fulfilled. And that each one of us here has asked for something today which we are receiving right now. And that is the grace of God. That is the beauty of generosity and love. So this piece um, combines the, the Ismaili devotional poem with a text, Adoramus Te Benedicimus Te, uh, which also expresses love and reverence for God. And uh, when I was doing this kind of work, uh, I had, after 9-11, I had written a piece that combined a Muslim prayer and a Christian prayer. And I was so excited about it, and I brought it to a school where a young Muslim um, woman was uh, studying. And I said, hey, look at what I brought. It's really interesting, and what do you think? She looked at it, and she said, nope, can't do it. I said, oh. And inside I felt, hmm. But I asked you know, a community member, and if they felt that it wasn't appropriate, then I, didn't, I wouldn't do it. Then about five minutes later, we were having lunch, and she says, actually, it's okay if you do it. But just honor each tradition first and then bring it together. So what you'll hear today in our rendition is uh, an honoring of two separate, uh, although connected traditions, and then brought together.
I've sung a lot of choral music and sang a lot about the love of Jesus and um, sang in many services and masses. I remember one uh, service I sang in was in Toledo, Spain. And I didn't know the history of Toledo, Spain until just before I went there. And it was one of those cities where there were cultural encounters amongst um, many peoples. I walked into the city and I was reminded of the Ismaili Center in Vancouver and the arches and the spaces. And I thought, where am I? And then, of course, our tour guide started telling us about how Muslim artisans were uh, involved in the making of the city and the Jewish synagogue was built by Muslims and then there was the cathedral and I just started feeling this all these worlds coming together for me and we went into the cathedral and we were singing in a church and in a smaller sanctuary in, during the church service and I just like I could not stop crying and I feel like it's because I returned home. And I returned home not only in one kind of music, but in integrated self. Um, I met someone at the coffee shop the other day, and he is writing a book, um, a black man. He's writing a book called uh, Go Back Where You Came From. And I think about that moment in Toledo, Spain, and yes, I went back where I came from, to that unity to that oneness, to that soul. And now I ask, like, how do we create more moments of those? Because Adoramus Te in a Catholic church brings you back to that remembrance in a different way than uh, a Hindu tradition or a Western Chinese tradition of spirituality. So how do we bring these together? So hearing and participating in music has been constant in my life and until I did my PhD I didn't realize how much constant it had been because it helped me embody these memories of feeling comforted and feeling belonging feeling home whether it was sing the lullabies of my grandmother in their her lap or my mom or singing the national Canadian anthem every day at elementary school with all my my fellow Canadians or reciting congregational devotional poetry in the Ismaili prayer hall or singing in a choir, or even singing English and Indian songs in the shower, right? They were all echoes reminding me of how I could hear myself in the world, the truth of myself. And what was similar across all these experiences were those feelings of comfort, peace, belonging, and safety, which I think of as characteristics of love. And each was a vital thread in the tapestry of my life. Additionally, I grew up in East Africa, and I'm a South Asian Gujarati ancestry from Northwest India, and multi-generational lived experience in East Africa, which is a hybrid Swahili culture, Arabic, Indian, colonial culture, um, uh, local tribal traditions, all were part of the Swahili experience. So I I understand now that I came to understand the world and how I heard the world was through, through this, through something that was connected and in a, in a weave that could also keep changing. Um, and so this is how I became, how I knew to be Muslim. This is how I knew to be East African Kenyan. This is how I knew to be Canadian. And this is how I know to be human now. Immigrating to central Alberta, and I know you were in, in Winnipeg, in the 70s was a very different experience. <laughs> we went from a culturally integrative one to a culturally homogeneous one. We faced various forms of division and oppression, and it forced us to reimagine how we would amplify this integrative worldview into being. And as much as I might tell the story of racism and how our lives were about fighting against racism, I realized that our commitment was the values of the faith, the Quranic directives, and this creative imagination to enable us to recreate an integrative way of being in the world. So reclaiming that 
and amplifying that became more powerful than fighting. And that became a fight. That became the counterpoint, the musical harmony that would uh, bring something new to our lives and hopefully the lives of others. And this was akin to a Mi'kmaq indigenous teaching from Eastern Canada, two-eyed seeing or multi-eyed seeing, um, shared by Albert and Mordena Marshall, where they talk about taking the best of Western knowledge and the best of indigenous knowledge, combining it and making new knowledge to make something that benefits all. And this is how I understand the Muslim point of view. And that's what we did when we came to to, to Canada, and even in East Africa, we started bringing the best together. And I explored this through music. I found joy in both the Ismaili tradition and choral singing. These two worlds, however, never met. They met in my heart, but not always in the world. My community would not be at choral concerts, and the choral audiences would not be in community spaces. And yet, I felt belonging bo in both. So, in 2011, when the tragic hap events in New York happened, it sparked, it kindled that fire even more. How can these worlds come together? When we were in Alberta, the racism was because of my skin color. But after 9-11, the discrimination tapped into the core of my identity, of that worldview that made me who I was. And that was even more challenging. And luckily, music, um, was a way to come together. The Ismaili represented the marginalized, you know, the, the voice that was being negated, and the choral music from the Christian tradition represented another community that I loved, but also was creating this binary together. And so I brought these two worlds together. And what you heard today is an is a expression of something like that. Ivo Markovic, He's a founder of a peace choir called Pantanama in Sarajevo. I love what he says, and this is in that bulletin as well. The song of our neighbor affects us, and we receive it and grow through it. Likewise, our song becomes our neighbor's heritage and, impart, and impacts their growth. In that interwoven spirituality and in the discovery of our own reflection in the other, no one loses, but instead it is the only way to grow. And Ivo's father died in the Bosnian War, and he said, I fought back with peace, not... He said, I got really angry. I had a chance to meet him in, in, on Zoom, and he said, I was very angry, and I could have been angry, but I chose a different path. I found strength in, mu in choral music, and I subconsciously harnessed its texture in my life. Um, it showed me how to work with others in harmony, how to listen more deeply, and how each voice could add something special. And like the poet Kabir says, we can find love when we enter anything without ego, bordered identities or beliefs. He actually says in his poem, we have to cut our head off to know love. That's the sacrifice of love, the ego and belief that we hold, that we want to stick to. So choir was a place for me to do that. I felt like one with others. My diversity, my difference didn't matter. And then I realized, wait, but we know love, but difference, it does matter. The Quran and many of these of our traditions talk about the gift of diversity. So how do we weave diversity back in from love? And that's where my musical uh, work started happening. And it resonated across my different lived experiences. And then music in this way became a form of expressing this pluralistic identity that was part of a worldview and my lived experience. And now as Canadians, we're charged with, what does that look like? What does multiculturalism look like? What does interculturalism look like? And I do believe that is, it is held in love and unity. I came to see in the multi-layered texture of mu choral music or all music, the possibility for all our threads to weave together. And this pluralistic imagination inspired me and has become the love of my life. To me, this integrative musical process is as much a smiley, as I said, as it is Canadian. They're bound by spiritual principles of unity, motivated by shared values, and expressed through an integrative weave of difference. 
Where does this leave me now? It leaves me open. It leaves me curious. I'm reminded of the words of Princess Zara Aga Khan, and that's, this is also in the bulletin. Pluralism is not just tolerance, tolerating the other. It's not just accepting that one lives in a diverse society, but it's having an active and profound understanding of the nature and culture of one's neighbors. So much so that then you can learn to appreciate the value that they bring to society. And I think we're starting to do diversity uh, better, but we're not always asking what are the gifts of the knowledge that others bring that can actually change and shift how we think and make society. Um, how do we make our acoustic and social architecture in such a way that all our gifts can contribute? Learning Western choral music that was part of the dominant school education um, was definitely an important part of starting to say, what about this is useful to make the world better? Um, fortunately, I loved it. And I literally and figuratively learned the song of the neighbor, singing in churches, singing in choirs, hanging around with my friends. My question is now, how will others come to know the song of my culture, of each of our cultures, of your culture, of the songs of our neighbors not represented in dominant education systems, the songs of the misrepresented and underserved? What will this mean for our society? And how do we come together? in that quest. And I do believe that we are all already connected to the wisdom of, of unity. And while we can come together in unity in the body of the church, what do we do with that unity? How do we start to say, what does it mean? And it's so difficult. I, turn, I put the toothpaste lid on, you don't put the toothpaste lid on. It creates like a two days of silence in the house, right? If we can't even do that, where's the love? The Song, and so song of Solomon, like where is, where is the love, right? Black Eyed Peas song, where is the love? So it's not easy. And I've, I've had a chance to work with diverse musical uh, uh, in music, musicians. I worked with an Arabic and Persian musician, for example. They, it didn't work because they couldn't get past whatever the ideas of their identities were. And yet we belong to the same tra like religious tradition, but it can, I worked with um, you know, a rock musician and a classical musician from Western, like living in the West, so to speak. That was difficult. So it's not always easy, but when we find the sweet spot, and that magical, when we return home in whatever it is, that becomes power and that becomes the transformation. And so thank you so much for, for taking this time to uh, allow me to share some of these words. It's a vision, it's a dream, and I think that it's possible. And in music, if we can know it, if we can know it here, we can certainly know it out in the world. So now before, um, before we, I, I sit down, I'd love to share with you a, a, t a little chant. It's shukran lila alhamdulillah. And it means I'll pray, uh, thanks be to God, praise be to God. And it appears in the, in the Quran, th that text, and it's very common in, in many other traditions. And the tune I heard from a, on a singer from Iran. So very straightforward, and it goes like, so the words are shukran lila. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And as you know, the word Allah is, an, is the Arabic word for God. Sometimes when I talk about Allah, it's, oh, we don't believe in Allah. I'm like, but you're a Christian. Yeah, we don't believe in Allah. But Allah is just another name of God. <laughs> right? So, shukran lillah. Alham, walhamdulillah. Shukran lillah. Walhamdulillah. And it goes like this. Very straight, simple. Shukran lila walhamdulillah Shukran lila walhamdulillah Shukran lila walhamdulillah Great choir and anyone else in the room feel free to add some harmonies Shukran lila Walhamdulillah, shukran lila, walhamdulillah, 
Or you can sing Shukran Lila Walhamdulillah all on one note. Or Shukran Lila Walhamdulillah all on one note. So you get to choose. Yeah. Creative agency. Okay. Here we go. And we'll repeat it a few times. And the beauty of zikr, it's, it's, it's a zikr, a remembrance. Um, Hazrat Inayat Khan said that when we repeat the name of God and, and reflect on God, then the universe repeats it and its power is felt in all, as, in all, in like all over the world, all over the universe. So that, and then that repetition becomes so much part of us that it doesn't even matter anymore because we become it. So it's such a beautiful feeling. So shukran lilam. And feel free to harmonize as you wish. Really add. Shukran lila alhamdulillah. Shukran lila alhamdulillah. Shukran lila alhamdulillah. Shukran lila. Shukran lila Shukran lila God bless. Thank you so much, Hussein, for sharing your story, and it's uh, sure to stay in our hearts and uh, hopefully in our music as well. So I'll now invite you to rise again in body or spirit as we sing When Our Heart is in a Holy Place, and the words are there this time, so that's excellent. <laughs> Just go with your talk, Hussein. <laughs> they were written by a Unitarian, by the way. Just sit for a second. I just want to let you know that as we draw our service to a close, I'd like to invite you uh, to stay in the sanctuary.
for 20 minutes or so with Hussein for a question and answer if you'd like to ask him questions. And there will be coffee up here so you don't even have to go downstairs to get it. Um, alternately, you can share your creative side with Kara downstairs or have a coffee with friends downstairs. And then at, um, let's say, just after noon, maybe 12.05, 12 we'll congregate downstairs. Uh, our president, Jonathan Fountain, is going to uh, say a few words in honor of our anniversary, and there'll be cake to share with everybody. And then before we extinguish our chalice, I just want to sincerely thank Hussein again and all the volunteers that helped to create this service. Um, with a special thanks to our, uh, our musicians, our choristers, and our songsters, all, all of you, who use uh, music to build bridges among us. So, we extinguish this flame. Thank you. 